Listeners, friends, that might be a little bit of a stretch. Listeners, <laughs> welcome to an intimate and perhaps boring, we're going to try to make it as unboring as possible, but we are doing a close reading of a text by Louis Althusser. And Louis Althusser, in my opinion, is the best Marxist on Marxism. Ooh, I will stand by that. This a, is that's a stake of a claim. You don't think? So? Okay, it's partially personal, just because he applies this structuralist method, and I'm quite familiar with the structuralist method. It's kind of where I do a lot of the rest of my stuff. So the way that he I wouldn't say combines, because that would be incorrect, but the way that he uses the terms, it feels very comfortable to me. So it feels very homey. And a lot of the problems that I would say are stereotypical of Marxism, or even the ones that we use as, as straw men, I think he solves a lot of those problems for me theoretically. But this is very much a theoretical text. It's very much a commentary on other Marxist theory. So if you're looking for uh, just a straight up praxis or how to organize a, a Soviet or organize a union, this Althusser is probably not the guy to go to, but he was a party man. He was a party man until the end. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's, he's one of those uh, French thinkers that has uh, kind of a sketchy, uh, some sketchy events in his life and a bit of a weird ending to it all. But um, maybe maybe that's a tired out subject that shouldn't be gone into right now. I'd rather look at what he's thinking about. Oh, and I'd, I, like, I'd like to go into it. I don't know what happened. Did he kill okay, his fine. wife? Yeah, Did he kill yeah that, that's it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the thing. And pleaded insanity or something like that. Wasn't it like a psychotic break? Yeah, yeah, I think he, he did it, got away with it. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think it happened, but it's so often presented as like, this is what's wrong with Marxism that it's just <laughs> yeah. so easy to just gloss over. It's like, oh, the, the Deleuze jumped out his window. This is what's wrong with postmodernism. Like, fuck all that <laughs> shit. I don't, I don't know. But like I said, this is like 19th century biographical readings of people's work. That's not, that's not kosher on this podcast. Anyway, this was, this was 25 years before that. And I don't, I don't know that Marxism is the kind of thing that causes uh, wife killings en masse. Maybe it is. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to start because this is, oh, it's so dense. I don't even know how we're going to do this in an episode. It's a nice intimate episode, Eric. And we can, we can bring back some of our other intimate episodes. Uh, I found a lot of crossover here with systems theory, which we talked about. I guess this is like almost two years ago that we did a deep dive into systems theory. Yeah, we did. And I, and I found some crossover here, which is another reason I probably like Althusser among Marxists. But I wanted to start generally, not reading quotes, but what problems is he addressing? Because he's talking, it sounds like at least, he's really talking to Marxists about what's wrong with Marxism. And our last episode was on post-Marxism with Diego, and we're kind of going to head in the direction of looking at what the possibilities of post-Marxist theory might look like. The first version of that, the people who kind of coined the term, Laclau and Mouffe, uh, they did this in the 80s, and they gave us their prescriptions for what post-Marxism looked like. It didn't really jive with any of us. We didn't really... I don't know. It didn't it didn't didn't give that hit. It didn't give that sense of satisfaction. But if we are going to do post-Marxism, I'd like to start with the best instead of starting with a straw man. Yeah. Well, this is like I mean the moment. This is the 60s we're looking at, right? We're looking at four marks from the mid 60s. So, this was a time of of huge you know, like a rich creative period of of development and expansion of of, you know, Al Althusser was like the the chair of a, like a, a a major French Marxist organization, and he was running a reading group, and pr eventually produced the book Reading Marx with Etienne Balabar and Jacques Ranciere and and all these other really famous thinkers and. 
I was just watching a video with Balabar in it. Like he's he's still going. A few of them are still going. I think we even did an episode where we was that with our our Ranciere and um our uh, our later Frankfurt School guy. What's his name? Yeah, we did Ranciere, the hatred of democracy. I believe. Yeah, and um, so these guys are still around in the '60s, but then in the '70s, you know, apparently Marx's theorization started to poop out, and it needed to be reinvigorated and and this is where sort of post marxist kind of thinking comes in is like you know 1985 hegemony and socialist strategy we got to we got to get rid of this sort of old catches that all the marxist theorization is in like base superstructure we got to get rid of that like that's kind of their angle on it but in, in a way i do i do think that this reading marx group and this for marx and some of Althusser's ideas are almost like the uh, what the 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 precursor to post Marxism. They they seem it seems to have started to open up Marxism in a way that gave postmodernism later the chance to kind of have its way with Marxist theory. <laughs> yeah, we needed to neoliberalize it. Not saying that the postmodernists neoliberalized it, but the Laclau and Move version is like. We need to focus on individual struggles and bring everybody together. And Marxism is one option on the supermarket of options. And capitalism is the thing that maintains all these choices. So we don't need to do anything to it. Yeah, and that kind of knee-jerk aversion to totalization was a major thing as well. They don't they don't want to totalize. We can't we can't subsume all of historical development under a single theoretical framework kind of thing. And and that's what they saw. You know, I think they saw Althusserian Marxism as both renewing, you know, the study of Marx along with the influx of Gramsci and 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 Benjamin and the rise of the new left, but also um, kind of taking it to its limits and showing us that it's it can't move forward on the old concepts anymore that Marxism has been stuck with, which whatever the marxism worldview marxism kind of thing how it's how it's developed over the 20th century after marx where <laughs> marx already had said in his lifetime i am not a marxist but oops there's a difference there between you know marxism and marxian theory where you're where you're studying marx sometimes it's marxology <laughs> which is which is alive and well today by the way and it's and it's very very interesting and althusser is an important figure in that too for some people yeah, this brings up another huge issue that I found because we, I mean, in shorthand, in conversation, as a podcast, as a YouTuber, I, you got to say just sometimes, this is what Marxism believes, or this is the Marxist worldview. And especially reading this, you get the sense of like, he's, he's boxing with a lot of other ideas. There's no such thing as Marxism. There's not even such thing as orthodox Marxism. There's so many schools each is dealing with a different part. For example, we've spent we spent like all of January and February talking about the Situationist International and Guy Debord, Society of Spectacle. Guy Debord specifically says, I like early Marx. I don't like late Marx. Late Marx is too academic. He's having debates. He's getting into all these details. He feels like he has to defend his theory. I like early Marx. Now, this is the flip side of that, because Althusser yeah. says, you shouldn't read early Marx, you shouldn't read Engels, the only thing that matters is late Marx, which is uh, the Marx of capital, and yeah, that's right. and, he, and he says he f Marx, later Marx fixed early Marx, but we shouldn't be paying attention to early Marx. So what are the problems here? What is he trying to fix? <laughs> First of all, humanism. That's right. Humanism is bringing into Marxism all of these I, bourgeois ideals, you could call them the bourgeois ideals of the Enlightenment. You're, we're not talking about equality. We're not talking about freedom. We're not talking about consciousness. All of that stuff about how capitalism feels, which is especially what De Bord was focused on. He's like, capitalism feels isolating. It feels atomizing. And the fact that it feels bad, I mean, this is... A, Sorry, this is a little bit of a simplification, but you know, 
We need to be focusing on these human values that are contradistinguished with what capitalism is doing. None of that really matters to Althusser. Yeah, like apparently, Mar he had, he introduced the idea that there's a break in Marx, a, an epistemological break between the early and the late Marx. That's one of the sort of enduring controversies of his work. Did, did Marx completely jettison his early humanism, all his talk of alienation and the development of human capacities to their fullest potential and, you know, kind of a manifestation of, of a, a true manifestation of human nature, as opposed to this sort of one-sidedness, this, this fragmentation, this subordination to capital. That's the question. Did he carry that over into his later work or did he go through this epistemological break such that we can like periodize Marx even into four phases, but with a clear break between the early stuff and the later stuff? That's Althusser argues for the break and he wants to have like kind of a, almost like a developmental theory of Marx where he gets rid of older concepts and brings in new ones. And that rubs a lot of people the wrong way, especially ones <laughs> that like <laughs> capital, but they don't want to see it as like not using this. Like they still think alienation is an important concept. Where we're, we're alienated from our sort of true, well, the path to, to, to developing capacities or, or human nature. Yeah. One of the things he says, for example, is one phantom is more especially crucial than any other today, the shade of Hegel. To drive this phantom back into, oh, sorry, <laughs> to drive this phantom back into the night, we need a little more light on Marx. Or what is the same thing? A little more Marxist light on Hegel himself. We can then escape from the ambiguities and confusions of the inversion. So how do we do this quickly? Um, basically, he says, if you just say that Marx inverted Hegel, then you're still doing Hegel, right? If you got a dialectic and then you just say, no, this one's in top, on top instead of the other one, then you're doing the same thing. And Althusser is very uh, impassioned about the fact that Marx is not an inversion of Hegel. And Marx said that he was, but Marx was wrong, right? <laughs> or, or at least early Marx was wrong. So we need to at least look carefully at what production has changed. And we are not going to be thinking about this binary anymore between superstructure and base that in his mind has caused so many of the problems of Marxists not agreeing with each other. And yeah, you go, he's going to bring structuralism as a, an antidote to this representationalism, especially when it comes to history. History is really important here. History is infinitely complex, as any of us knows. But if you come at it too conceptually or too representationalistly, then you're just going to be finding the thing that you're looking for, imposing it on history, and you actually don't get any explanations out of that. And it's not going to figure out, you know, how is art or literature, or theory, how does it fit in to the hmm, capitalist economy? I guess you could say that. Mm -hmm. That every one of these different modes of life, which he gets from a structuralist by the name of Claude Levi-Strauss, you have to look at production individually. You have to look at production in every case. Because whatever... Uh, I want to say discourse is the first word that comes to mind. He probably wouldn't like that. But, you know, all of these different codified systems that we have that are developing. We got art and the other aspects of culture. Theory is a developmental process, builds upon itself. Family structures. You can't go back and ultimately say that the capitalist economy determines each of these things. You have to look at their own modes of production. Yeah, it's a it's a little difficult to understand what he does on the production side from just this one article. Or the the this book, by the way, Four Marks, nineteen sixty five, is like a collection of articles that he published. This was like him bursting onto the scene in the sixties too, right? He's he didn't publish a whole lot in the fifties, and then suddenly in the sixties he publishes Four Marks and Reading Marks or Reading Capital. 
and he becomes a huge intellectual figure and gets embroiled in in also these enormous controversies with like European Marxists from like Britain and other places. Um, particularly, I just wanted to read that quote. The particularly another famous Marxist named E. B. Thompson, who uh, who says he he. I refuse these spurious choices which theoretical practice seek to impose, and instead I declare unrelenting intellectual war against such Marxisms. I do so from the tradition of one whose major founders is Marx. Um, he really, really did not like what they were doing to Marx. Uh, okay, fair enough. There's, there's some other figures who who didn't like them either, but that's probably the spiciest quote, <laughs> declaring unrelenting intellectual war. So there's there's maybe the origin of infighting on the left, E.P. Thompson. And, and <laughs> no, and no, that goes no, back. That can't be the origin. <laughs> but, but can you tell me, like, what was his, what was his specific objection? Because I haven't uh, read that bit. Well, he's E. P. Thompson wrote the um, the uh, what's the name of the text the 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 formation of the working class in in mm. in England and I think it is this structuralist methodology and this anti humanism or this application of structuralism anti humanism like where's the agency right This was a big time of talking about the difference between structure and agency and and Althusser's thinking seems to come down pretty clearly on the side of structure and really you know diminishes agency quite a bit and i think that rubs some the wrong way depending on your view of of like how and where revolution is supposed to come from uh if there's no agency in the picture then then that just seems like a vanishingly difficult goal to achieve if you have to wait for the right um we call it conjunction to to provide the conditions for a revolution to become possible, and then the generation of a revolutionary subjectivity and the fusion of all these subjectivities into a single mass, which can oppose the ruling classes. So that becomes vanishingly unlikely if you're a structuralist who sees the structural causation as the dominant force shaping shaping human reality and if i can give a defense of althusser on this point the criticism is that if you if you try to read marx too philosophically this is something de board would have said too if you make it into an intellectual preoccupation then you're not facing any of the actual challenges of labor in real situations or praxis and all that stuff um, I would say, I would say, okay, it's possible. However, the defense of what Althusser is doing is saying, it, like, uh, again, with structuralism specifically, um, and we could go back to uh, the origin of structuralist linguistics with like Saussure or something, that none of these boundaries are closed. If you want to close a boundary, you want to say, okay, the economy is a closed boundary. Or you want to say the proletariat is a closed boundary. Or even the commodity, I guess you could. I, I, want, to, I want to specify that a little bit more. I don't have the, uh, the time to do that right now. But when you look for all these Marxist terms and then you say, this is that, Althusser is a structuralist, is saying you are signifying something you're representing it to your mind in a way that makes you miss all the details and for him especially you're missing all the details of how something comes into the world so especially i mean most people know althusser for his critique of ideological state apparatuses his research into ideological state apparatuses or theories about it come from the most specific examples and draw or try to develop conclusions from there. Because if you think that ideology is just a lie that everyone believes, then the easy there should be an easy solution. You just convince them, hey, this is a lie that you believe. Whereas with the ideological state apparatus, 
it's this mess that you're called into unfreely. You don't make a choice to be deceived by ideology. You are birthed into ideology, which is why you can't just trust subjective, subjectivist accounts of everyone's believing ideology. No, as soon as you answer your name, you are part of the apparatus of ideology. So while it might be true that, you know, if you're trying to form a, a, a union, then then Althusser might not be all that useful because all you need to say is the bosses are exploiting your labor. You have the capacity to change it. Let's go. That might be true. But if you're a Marxist theorist and he's really talking to theorists, he's a he's a centralized Parisian academic. If you really want to figure out where these points of tension are, you need to be less representationalist. You have to signify a little less or at least understand that the things you're looking for in history, the things you're looking for in development, the things you're looking for in society are not going to be as simple as putting a Marx word on a problem that you notice. Like, just because you feel lonely, you can't just rush in there and put alienation right on top of it. You have to look at the production. You have to look at the production of what material events could say, led you to having this feeling or living this life. So I would, I would push against saying this is not useful for Marxism because it is really a call, like most of the structuralists, to say the thing that you say you're talking about is not actually what you're talking about. I get the sense that these sloganeering even just similar, seems like similar to what you're saying. There's a lot of slogans that seem to be going around. Even that that chapter on linguistics in 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 the thousand plateaus, I can't remember the French term they used, but they're basically talking about slogans, and and kind of like watchwords, thing, re, repeated phrases. Yeah, you're you're at your dumbest when you let words think in your place, which is something that we all do a lot. I do that a lot. I, I just get the sense that this was a big thing. And to be fair to Althusser, he's working on the one side against like sort of the more hardcore Stalinists. And on the other side, he's working against what we already mentioned, like the humanist Marxists who are influenced by Lukács and Sartre. And they're delving into early Marx, Marxist humanism, and they're Hegelian. They're Hegelianizing Marx. And so he's working against both of those directions. He's working against the more sort of Stalinist, which was which was kind of unraveling around that time with all the atrocities coming to light, and and even within his own party, right, the French Marxist Party, he's he's a member, but he's critical of them, and he's critical of both currents, humanism and Stalinism, in in Marxist theory. So he's working against. He's he's hemmed in on both sides by by different things he's he's got in mind what he's working against but yeah he has some nice phrases about that like we shouldn't let these sort of slogans do our thinking for us but there are a lot of Althusser sound bites I think what comes out of this text for Marx is he calls himself a, he's a Marxist in philosophy <laughs> so he's doing theorizing and he's doing philosophy and he makes that clear and there's also people taking umbrage with that as if as if getting the theory right is going to do the class struggle for us. Mm. I don't know if that's really a fair critique but uh, you know that's that's the sort of that's the sort of uh, invective people throw around so that's how it goes and mm, whether or not Althusser is still an important figure in many people's thinking especially for bringing Lacan into play in Marxist theory but also structuralism. So He's a good guy to read. Anyway, this was a this was a fascinating chapter to read. And he says that Marx gives, I guess from a, a a structuralist standpoint, he gives the terms, but the terms are never just the terms. You have to look at before you can draw a conclusion about an individual situation, you have to actually look at the material factors going into that. So he he likes when Marx writes uh, the 18th Brumaire, the Civil War in France. So he's kind of 
as a theorist, like self-admittedly, I'm doing theory, but he's also saying theory is not about drawing a giant cartoon picture of the history of the world. Theory is about looking at specific details and finding out the methods of production that come into there. And he says, basically, no one has done this um, except for Gramsci. Everyone else is on the shit list. Sartre especially is on the Sart, sorry, is on the shit list. But he said, Gramsci is the only one who followed up to the explorations of Marx. Even Engels is on the shit list. <laughs> yeah. And, and to be fair to his philosophy position, too, if you look at reading Marx pretty early on, there's a chapter on how to read. He's, he talks about like a method of reading, and that's this famous symptomatic method of reading where you're not looking at what the text means. You're trying to look at the conditions which allowed this reading of a text to be produced. So you're reading in a very presentist mode, and you're trying to look at what is this, how is this relevant, how can we bring this into the now, but at the same time paying attention to both the conditions that produced this text and then the conditions under which we are producing our new text. And that's the kind of the nutshell of the symptomatic reading method, which he develops and applies to capital with this reading group with Balabar and Rancier and et al. And uh, it's, it's fascinating. And in here, you can see the same sort of thing going on with, you know, Lenin's looking at, for instance, he's looking at what's going on in Russia, but he's also been reading, right? He's, he's experienced, he's, he's, he's building his revolutionary theory, not just on the world around him, but he's looking at earlier texts like the 18th Brumaire you mentioned, and, and even, you know, other revolutions, the 1905, the Commune, the Germany, 1840, what is it, seven or eight failed revolution there. And he's looking at all of these and, and reading is the way we do that. We uncover this knowledge and experience of what revolution can do and what it can't do, under what conditions does it fail. So for him, this is an important venture is to come to it from theorize Marxism and, and, and alter the theory and do these little reading groups, right? With our symptomatic reading strategy. So I have a question for you. What's that? So if we're if we're gonna look at these, because he wants to do, you know, you you can't look at theory separate from the mode of production that is the economy. And he says, you know, it's correct, as Engels said, that if we theorize society, it's gonna be economic in the last instance. So we're not in economic determinism. Um, I don't think Marx is an economic determinist. I don't think that a lot of people do. I think that shoddy readings that pop up very often, or tweets, you know, um, they are economic determinists. They're saying like the the stuff you're talking about doesn't matter. It's the mode of production. But productive activity for him is going to be present as soon as you start doing theory. So my question that I can't really figure out from this, because when we, when we get to you know post '80s theory or post '80s like literature analysis, then we look at an author, we look at the, where they were born, we look at their class position, and say a whole bunch of stuff like, oh, this is reproducing bourgeois ideology, and it's because this person was born in this place at this time. So if we're gonna read literature like that. Do you, how do, do you think that's what he's saying? Like we need to be very concrete about where all of our products and not necessarily a, a product that is, you know, bought and sold, but even a novel, we need to look at the very details under which that emerged and including the author's personal biography. Is he saying that? Because this, this, this article came out before any of that was a concern in, in literature theory, I think, but is that where he's is that where he's going with this? I don't know. That would be maybe something you'd have to read the text to answer more carefully. You know, I I wouldn't get the sense that it's it's the the conditions that produce the the author or shape their life. I mean, that would be a part of it. But you're you're looking at the conditions that are going on behind your back as well at the same time as you're reading the text. You're looking at 
your own conditions. You have to have a theory again because you have to have a theory of of sort of what's going on in the world so you can and how to how to grasp it so you can do this presentist reading and produce a text that that is you know key to the issues so they're not doing marxology they're not interested in like getting marx right so much as they are applying marx in the right way and 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 get, getting rid of what they don't need and 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 renovating or or adding what they do need so I think it's, but you do have to look at the the conditions under which the text you're reading was produced, and then your own. So it's like you know what we say is is now you have to have positionality. You have to you have to put yourself in your research. You have to make your your commitments and your interests and your status and position like known, so that someone who comes along later and reads the text can be like, okay, well this person has these kinds of commitments and these kinds of beliefs. So I can sort of use that to help me read their own text. I don't know, positionality of the researcher. That's a big thing we're always taught. But I think, I don't know, symptomatic reading seems a little more complex and and, and, and uh, has a goal <laughs> as opposed to just kind of being honest about where your, uh, where your funding is coming from or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of a f this 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 fantasy of transparency. Like, if you put it all on the page, then it's true, or then you've then you've addressed the potential issues. I I don't think that's what he's saying, really. It's more like history, and if you want to divide society, right? You can divide society into a bunch of stuff. You can say politics. We got economy over here. We got the artistic production and production of literature over here, and. The concept, if we can get into the text and the title of the text, this word overdetermination, because overdetermination, there's a an infinite complexity that I think he thinks most Marxists will not admit to. There's just an infinite complexity. There's accidents. There's stuff that seemingly comes out of nowhere, unpredictable events. And you can't theorize, this kind of, kind of goes back to our systems theory stuff before. You have a position of observation, but to theorize anything, you have to reduce complexity. You have to take all of the events that happen ever and reduce them into a sort of narrative. Now, Marxism, all Marxisms do that. All theories, you could argue, do that. But he's arguing for, you have to fo start on a detail, start on an instance. Don't say that everyone's just stupid and deceived by ideology. You got to find out the actual events in which ideology is brought into the world. And kind of mirroring Lacan, pun intended, the mirror stage would be one of those events, if you could, if you could argue. His act. Uh, his, uh, uh, moment of interpolation is that you're already caught in ideology. The only thing you could ever do is look back at the moment you were in ideology because you can never be outside. And as a theorist, you can never be outside of theory. And as a historian, you are never outside of history. And I think a lot of his complaints or objections to the way Marxism is being done by unnamed people, people that he accuses of this and that, is that if you're if you're a true Marxist, you look at the means of production, which is the most not as a representation, but as the most concrete event of what one person does at one moment in time, and then you work out from there. Instead of saying we're going to start with concepts and then find what those concepts represent, which you know is kind of. Ex are not even kind of. It's exactly what structuralism on the whole was really about. This term doesn't refer to this one singular closed off reality. It belongs to a chain of things that it's not. It's a differential thing. So I don't know. I'm as you can probably tell. I'm 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 standing this pretty hard because I agree with it. That if you look for something especially in a, in a word as complex as history, 
you're going to find whatever you want there because it's infinitely complex. The question is, if you're doing theory about something, Marxist theory in this case, you have to acknowledge the things that you're simplifying. And to his mind, humanist Marxism, Hegelian Marxism, representationalist Marxism, that's just sneaking in all of these aspects of classical economics um, and then looking for them and then finding them and then saying, look, I found the thing that I'm looking for. That's not how you do proper theory. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting in view of the symptomatic reading that he's, his, his concept Can you explain of- explain that? I'm not sure what that means. The symptomatic reading. Well, that's like what I was saying before about reading with the, reading with, um, you're not looking at the meaning of the text per se on the page, you're trying to get to the conditions of the production of this text, what conditions lay behind the production of this text. And and you're doing that both for the text you're reading and and that time that it came out of and, and your own reading of the text. We're reading, let's say we're reading Capital right now. We need a sense of our, our the conditions which may be influencing or producing our own reading. Right, if we're reading it in a presentist way, and and his, his actually his his definition of ideology is is about you know the imaginary relationship of people to their real conditions of existence, and the the imaginary is is like a technical term from Lacan, um, which we're probably not going to go into that side of things, but yeah, imaginary relationship to your real conditions of existence. So ideology is it, in in. Althusser's definition is going to influence your reading, and you have to be aware of that as far as you can be. Can you escape ideology? Can we ever step out of it? Well, that's always been the big problem, right, with arguing about false consciousness and why people do things that seem to be against their own interests because of ideology, because they're false consciousness and something. But that's another kind of maybe humanist Marxist idea that Althusser is pushing back against, right? Because the simplicity of the Althusserian or the, the the humanist Marxists, they simplify by using Hegel's dialectic, <laughs> which sounds crazy because there's nothing simple about it. But for him, right, overdetermination is a confluence of, of multiple contradictions that create a certain situation or a conjuncture. Right. And, and, and that's how history proceeds to these conjunctures. Right. Because when Marx starts capital, right, he's, he's like, we're going to abstract. Right. Well, that, that's what we have to do. We have to start with abstraction. He has that nice quote about, you know, you can't use a microscope to find value. You can't, you can't break something down with experiments and find some, some physical substance of value. You have to, the first thing you have to do is abstract. And so what's the basic form of, of capitalist mode of production is the commodity form. So he starts with the commodity form and then he gets to value and then he gets to money in the third, in the, in the next chapter, in those first few chapters of capital. So that's, you know, the Marxist method, Okay, it's abstraction, but yeah, this this what I was saying. This the simplification of this dialectical perspective that he thinks these humanist Marxists are using. The dialectic is never overdetermined because Alf Gehebung is is suppression and overcoming. It internalizes the previous contradiction and it and it kind of doesn't play a role then in the next stage of development. It suppresses the former contradiction as it overcomes it. Suppression, cons conservation, cancellation, all those meanings we're told that Aufgeheben has, has all these weird meanings. And so you get to a whole eventually, the idea, but you've gotten there from a, a determination. One th one stage is determinative of 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 the contradictions, and et cetera, et cetera. You don't get over determination is the is the issue, right? So that's why over determination. And then he gives this long example of how Russia over time <laughs> collected all of these contradictions, right? It it was very progressive, but it was also very very backwards. It had a czar. 
base essentially like a king, but it was also kind of modernizing at the same time and had extraordinarily progressive elements in its society. It was the the odd man out in the uh, geopolitical landscape. It had the most, and therefore it was the uniquely the place where revolution would happen if it were to happen anywhere, and it did. 1905, and then again a decade later. And it wasn't supposed to happen there. But Althusser is very against that kind of language. Like, oh, it's supposed to occur in uh, Germany first. And he says this supposed to is a bad reading of cause and effect. So I don't know what, what kind of, what, what mental definition, like heuristic, are you using when you hear overdetermination? Because what I'm working with is you are saying that like one contradiction, you can isolate it, you can simplify it enough so that it looks like a single contradiction. And honestly, I don't know if, a, if current Hegelians actually do this. I don't think they do. But his objection, at least, to Hegelianism in general is you find the contra contradiction that produced the next stage and you can simplify it enough so that it looks like it's just one. Whereas overdetermination means that there's there's contradictions that you notice, there's contradictions that you don't notice. There's nothing that you could call a movement of history because history is an infinite amount of events. And for it to be something that one thing leads to the next, you would have to reduce all the events that are important from all the events, or necessary would be his term, the necessity, you would have to separate those from all the events that are unnecessary or that are accidental. And to do this as a theorist, I think you could say in his terms, that's just irresponsible. That's giving a position to human knowledge and theoretical knowledge that just dominates, you know, all of nature, every single thing that happens, where you're like, I can sit here and determine this thing from this thing from this thing. Whereas his mode of looking into these is, let's take a single example. Let's look for the contradictions in one example. And then if we have time, you know, if we have enough time in our life, then we can move out from there. Or do you have a different definition of overdetermination? Sorry, that was a long roundabout way of asking, <laughs> what do you think overdetermination means? <laughs> yeah, my... Uh... I mean, my my heuristic is usually that if if determination in this sense for him, I think dialectic is is a simple it, dialectic is simplistic. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, whatever. As difficult as Hegel's texts are, as a motor of history, <laughs> the the dialectic would be simple. So you can't really just take Hegel's dialectic and invert it in the sense of just giving it a new object. Instead of spirit and the, and mind, it's now material reality. You can't just do that. You have to transform the dialectic to its core, <laughs> right? And and for him, the outcome of that is is instead of working with simple contradictions between two opposed elements were looking at an overdetermination where multiple contradictions accrue in a certain and, and that's and that'd be historical if you want to look at examples of that sort of thing and it's same sort of thing with Marx right he's abstracting what I was saying he's abstracting the commodity form so we can look at the capitalist mode of production in his purest way but in practice, we live in mixed modes of production. There is still slavery in our society. There is still serfdom and indentured kinds of personal relationships of domination between people. And we have this overbearingly burgeoning thing we call the capitalist mode as well. It's always mixed. But if you want to do an analysis of capital, you got to start by abstracting from all that messiness and try to come up with some some pure concepts, not formal, but form has a kind of a different meaning here. But you got to start with the commodity form and and and, and get your pure theory <laughs> out of the way, and then and then you can start to look at the real conditions and 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 notice the mi the mixing and the mat. And I think overdetermination is a way of of trying to account for that you know you div instead of just having a base and a superstructure you have the level of the economic base the means of production and the the relations of production that 
obtain as a result of that configuration. And then the ideological superstructure. He's breaking it down into different levels. All right, you have the level of the economic still, but you also have the political, the societal, and the theoretical. Sometimes he calls it theological. Sometimes he even just puts philosophy up there on the fourth level. And you got to look at those four levels. And so I, I thought it was a little bit like systems theory in that way, because it's very much like Talcott Parsons for yeah. kinds of ways of, of, of analyzing through his social theory. But at that time in the 60s, you know, American social theory was seen as bourgeois science. So they had no truck with it. But Althusser's theory does have some like strange echoes of it. So he's opening it up, right? That's what, that's what, and that's essentially what, you know, Chantel Mouffe and, or, or, I mean, yeah, and an Ernesto Leclau were saying is that like, if you want to save the, the, the base superstructure, distinction then then like Althusser represents the most advanced kind of fanciest footwork way of of preserving this basic base superstructure distinction and for them they just like they just say like let's just get rid of that like you know they they don't see these levels these four levels as as sort of relatively autonomous levels in which the economic level is in the last instance the determining level, but the the last instance may just like never come because things keep happening. <laughs> Other things keep happening. They just say, fuck the last instance, fuck not the last instance. We don't want any of that. We just want to have relatively autonomous spheres that are equally determinative of history. We, I, I honestly, I went through a bit of a struggle with this because Part of what it is to say that every event is overdetermined, it's the same as saying that every event is unknowable. You can't know causation. Causation is not the sort of thing that you can figure out, which I agree with. So I'm, I, that's not the part I was struggling with. But I, I, I feel the pain of those Marxists who are like, well, then there's no praxis because if what you're saying is true, then it's impossible. And I feel like he's right. You can't reduce, and this is a systems theory term, you can't reduce infinite complexity to the sort of puzzle that you can just figure out and then walk away from it because you finished it. Um, what this is to say, epistemologically, and he uses Marx to defend this, that history is infinitely complex. And for him, this is to be found in Marx. The infinite complexity is in the fact that the, the relationship over the means of production is never the same. It's never the same in one situation to the next in the same society, let alone in history as a whole. So, yeah, I, I would there's say many groups, right? There's 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 many underclasses, you could call them, right? Like there's not just the working class in the industrial factory. There's many different kinds. Yeah, there's the prisoners in the prison system that are also producing. They're not part of the working yeah, class, especially in the private prisons in the states, right? Yeah. So he's saying once you get down to or once you try to get down to the bare bones of this, you're going to be doing simplification. And this is true, I have to assert, this is true of any theory. Always theory, you need to simplify. But the starting position is really what he's object objecting to because in a Marxist paradigm, and I guess he would call this orthodox Marxism, or we sometimes use that as a shorthand, but it applies to so many people who are like, I'm a Marxist and then I'm gonna do it this way, which is to generalize history and then find the details that fit your generalization. And on the contrary, this concept of overdetermination is to say, there's this inertia in things that happen. There's an inertia that is caused by a complexity that cannot ultimately be reduced. There is always a gap in this distinction between I am now talking about the political sphere. I am now talking about the social sphere. I am now talking about the sphere of labor, 
whatever the fuck that means. So in yeah. a sense, I can see why people would disagree with this, even though he's right, because it takes away the theorist's job a little bit, or it says your job doesn't matter nearly as much as you think it does, because you're basically standing back from a history that you're a part of um, inexorably, and you're writing a story about it, and you want us to take the story seriously. And I, I don't know. That's why... I, I I understand why people would object to it because sometimes really what we need is a good story. What you need to get the workers to rise up is not a bunch of theoretical complexity. You need a good story. But on the other hand, this is true because it's beholden to the omnipotence of thought, the omnipotence of human reason to say, I can figure out what caused what in any context, you know? So this is mm -hmm. why he likes the scientific Marxism as opposed to the humanist Marxism that just ushers in sneakily through the back door a whole bunch of humanist and enlightenment ideals. Yeah, or, or to quote, uh, the comfortable and reassuring idea of a pure, simple dialectical schema, which in its very simplicity seems to have retained a memory of the Hegelian model and its faith in resolving power of the abstract contradiction as such. Abstract contradiction. We got to look at the real contradictions, which, which even a transformed kind of like Hegelian dialectic taken out of its speculative philosophy mystical shell would not give us because Marx does not take all of Hegel's components of his dialectic he takes <laughs> some of them like you know you can see quantity and quality you can see those things in in capital and he makes hegelian moves and he and he even you can quote marx saying like i i flirt with hegelian formulations as a way of kind of coquetting with my work but i don't know to the degree which he's committed to the <laughs> dialectic as a methodology is 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 in question here but i mean that that's true that what you were saying that complexity of the labor situation right like i could not help and by the way a good shorthand for remembering over determination is just read that section on russia and he says russia you know the situation in russia was precisely a result of the intense overdetermination of the basic class contradiction I couldn't help but think of the United States as being the place today. Is that not what we would then need to look for? Is where in the world right now is accruing this level of intense overdetermination where you have like sort of backwards and forwards elements so close together? It's like the fucking United States, right? Like banning abortion right now. And look at the, the working class struggles going on right now. In the news recently, I have seen uh, strikes coming from rail workers, from all those crazy fucking white noise style Don DeLillo crashes, <laughs> releasing chemicals. I've been seeing nurses and, and, and medical workers, the Starbucks stuff. Yeah, all that unionization stuff at Starbucks and Amazon. I've been seeing all kinds of different groups, the Uber drivers, like ev like so many different like how do we bring all of that together that what needs to happen is is what he calls here now a fusion <laughs> if this situation is right which it seems to be in the united states but who fucking knows then there must be some kind of like the now here's the situation for a fusion to emerge but you're never going to see this if you're using the dialectic untransformed you're just going to see you know simple pure contradictory ideas and an abstract progression of history towards some kind of end, which is where his anti-humanism comes from. There's no subject of history, he's saying. That's one of his famous lines, right? There's no subject of history. We're not, you know, that's what anti-humanism or the problem of the subject of history. We're looking, it's like what I said last time, we're looking for the revolutionary subject. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? By the 60s, it's like, okay, well, it's not the working class because they they like their abuse. They yeah. want to be whipped. So who is it? Is it is it is it someone, is it new sexualities? Is it new, I don't know, job groups that are emerging? Is it, is it's it the, us? It's the students. Is it, is it me? I don't know. No, like you got to look who's the revolution. No, the, the revolution has to produce the subjects. That's the whole point. You never know till it happens and it might not ever happen. <laughs> yeah. That, I want to, I want to stress that that's a great insight, man. I really, 
I, I'm sitting here stroking my beard thinking about that because the revolutionary subject, I don't know, if you want to... If you want to go back to the the French Revolution and say this is like the bonded bourgeoisie and then all the hungry people behind them, and then in a in a Marxist formulation or at least a crudely Marxist formulation, the kind of Marxism that we're trying to deny here, representationalism, then the subject of history is not individuals any longer. It's the proletariat. It's the the proletarian class suddenly comes into awareness, hopefully we pray and hope and sit on our hands waiting, and then that becomes the revolutionary subject of history. Mm -hmm. But this is saying the opposite, the anti-humanism aspect of it is subjectivity does not precede events. Events produce subjectivities. And if you know Althusser's ideological state apparatuses, yeah, the, his, his right. theoretical example is... The interaction with the police is what creates your subjectivity in certain cases. So, or <laughs> Lacan even, your interaction with the mirror is what casts you into the imaginary. And you become the eye that says I after that, and you know what you're talking about, but you actually don't know what you're talking about. So this, the confrontation is what creates what we call subjects after the fact, but the wrong-headed version of this philosophy is to say that subjects come first, that if we only awoken all of them, if we turned off Fox News and forced them to read the Communist Manifesto, then the revolution would occur. But the case is you, no one, no one has the freedom, the consciousness, the control to make that happen. The in, we could call it the environment to to use our systems theory again. The environment causes subjectivities. So the only thing that could do a revolution is not the status quo at the moment. It doesn't look like, I'd say. We're not sure. But crises, for example, widespread crises produce subjectivities. But you can't produce the subjectivity first. Yeah, to bring about the crisis, to bring about the revolution. True, true. Yeah. So that's so a good, we have that's no, a better formulation than I did. It's like, yeah. Yeah, we have no subject of history. And he also wants to get rid of the historicism of of Marxist thinking, which which sounds a little bit strange at first, but historicism would be maybe associated with someone like uh Foucault now. Um, but just I think historicism Instead of historical, the dialectic is historical, but it's not historicist. And when you say historicist, what you're talking about is 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 sort of a, a relativistic position. Then it's relative, like the ideas and the possibilities of that time are relative to that point in time. You're historicizing. You're a historicist. Like it's like I I want to read Shakespeare as a historicist. Okay, I got to go back and look at like productions in the 17th century and 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 try to see like what the meaning of the play is based on like what people believe during that time. Uh, what does Shakespeare then mean in the next century? I got to go look at that. There's no kind of enduring continuity between those sorts of things. And and for the dialectic right there is continuity the the pattern is continuity and interruption right it's the back and forth it's the pendulum we always we kind of have that phrase right like one step forward two steps back that implies there's continuity and interruption for for althusser that's historicist historical would mean that there are just breaks there are not you know history has breaks and then there's the old is that I've gone and there's something new and there's a break. There's a kind of discontinuity to history, but there's still, so we don't, we can't historicize because like, well, we're in the new, how do we really ever get back to what people would have thought at that time? We can only kind of look from our position in history and see the meaning in relation to ourselves. That's all, that's all we can do. It's, you're not being a historicist. You're, you're just, historical 
Yeah, historicism is kind of just like saying everything has a direction. And you, can, you can't tell what the direction is at the moment, even according to historicists, but you can tell after the fact, oh, we became more free by positing this and this, or this event happened and it produced more freedom than had it existed before. The French Revolution, say. Or now from our position, we can see how this was all culminating to yeah. this end point kind That's of, it, the, kind of way of thinking. The Whig interpretation of history is that all of history led to us in our democracy. Um, but yeah, history is not that kind of object. History is not that kind of thing that can be studied as it has a direction. To believe in that is to believe in this omnipotence of thought, this kingdom of thought that is in the ultimate sense, the most true thing, that the real is rational and the rational is real Hegel. Get rid of that, says Althusser. Get out of that thinking. This is an infinitely complex chain, chain network. I don't know what you'd call it. There are in so many independent variables, so many dependent variables that producing a single narrative from our minuscule perspective, and I'm editorializing a little bit because this is my view, it's not in the text, but to, to generalize your experience to the whole of history, it's just stupid and it's its own contradiction. But language yeah, well, makes that possible. Back to the structuralists, language makes that possible. Yeah, like his, his idea of the unevenness of, of capitalist development, I think speaks to that as well. Yeah, it's not like a chain as so much as thinking of it as, as, as like fragments, heterogeneous fragments, historically heterogeneous fragments even. Because at one time, remember those four levels I, I mentioned, the, the, the relations of production level, political, social, theoretical, each of those levels can have components which may be from different historical times different periods. You can isolate them. You're not homogenizing the historical period. You actually sort of, that's what the historicist would do is they would look at everything as, you know, this homogenous sort of <laughs> bequest <laughs> in, a, in some historical periods. Whereas Althusser sees, again, just like the Russia example, all of the, the these, <clears throat> these um, contradictions that are accruing each have their own history and they each have their own point of origin and they may be very different and they may originate even as as anti-revolutionary concepts they may originate as something that was meant to suppress the working class but the the fact that they've all come together in this configuration in this state of intense overdetermination means that something happens there's like a spark there they're originally anti-revolutionary because you know you can't foresee how these things will play out. They're anti-revolutionary thrust originally. When they arrive in this situation, it creates a condition. It creates a conjuncture in which revolution becomes possible. As in again, this Russia example. So even these these different levels, they're not homogenous historically. They 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 have all these different components that each have their own. And so he's opening up this field as well, and within the superstructural analysis. So that's another component, I think, of his historical view, is that they can come from different modes and different periods of history. You can have, again, elements of feudalism and slave economies coexisting with capitalist modes and and other things as well. It's like it's not unlike, um, not unlike, but you can probably see the difference between. Raymond Williams' theory of residual, dominant, and emergent, right? You have the re residue of the old mode. You have the, the, the emergent, let's say, whatever, I don't know, something new. If, it, if we're in the capitalism would have been emergent in the period where feudalism was dominant, and then the residual would have been slave society or something before that. But you can still see that's kind of a, a dialectical chain as opposed to just these like sort of fragments of history coexisting in in a single place in a single time. Hmm. And yeah. And, and famously too, you know, Raymond Williams has his base superstructure theory, and he tries to open it up by 
positing a dialectic between them, right? Like like the the base determines the superstructure and the superstructure determines the base. There's a there's a mutually determinative kind of relationship which I don't know, mutual the, anything that's mutual to me seems like a seems like a trap. Yeah, I'm trying to the, theoretically anyway. I'm puzzled but I'm trying to fit this into where you're talking about all these all these modes exist together. Like for example, we still have a queen. Oh, no, we don't. We still have a king. You and I are are, yeah. are subjects of the crown. And ultimately, like the Marxist view, I don't know if this is Marx or just Marxists, because it sounds like Marx to me, but I think Althusser would point out that there's more contradictions than one in play here, that they did not gain wealth by the exploitation of labor necessarily. They have They have accumulated wealth from a previous system. And the accumulation still exists, except that they don't own it. The crown lands are now owned by the government, and the government is able to rent them or you know lease them to private companies. So is that the same type of contradiction as exists between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, or is that a different form of contradiction? I'm sure there's actually probably an easy answer to this that I just don't know, but at least I can say... This is not the same thing as bourgeoisie and proletariat as the subject of exploitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would even think back to um, again to the when we were doing the Situationist, and I read that article about um, like the the what was it the riots and. Um, the board was almost saying like here's the revolutionary subject it is it is uh it is black people in the united states there's the revolutionary subject that's kind of he almost explicitly says that whereas i think althusser would see you know again these coexisting different ways of being you, like in canada i would look at like indigenous ways of being and their modes of production right that have this this they have a relationship with capitalism in canada and all their crown land and stuff is relevant there too what you're saying but but it's different it's it's a different mode of production it's it's something that's managed to survive the immense fuckery that was colon that still is colonialism <laughs> and so you have these mixed mixed modes you have different thing i don't know maybe i'm getting it wrong but that seems to be what he might be thinking about well i do want to clarify these are these are taken into the new mode right but if I think what he was he would say if you're going to look at a specific mode of production you can't account for colonialism specifically within a bourgeoisie or a, a bourgeoisie versus proletariat system because then you would be you would be leaving too much out but I wanted to at least close on this or or ask the question because this is one of the most interesting questions to come out of this Marxism is very often accused by people who don't understand it and sometimes by people who do understand it as being economically determinist. And Althusser mm -hmm. tries to carefully step around this, um, allow it to be possible, but not really say that this is the case. So if you're an economic determinist, then you say, in the end... All, histor all historical change, um, even most historical events, in the end, in the last place, you can say has some economic cause. And Engels specifically says, if you're saying that's the only cause, you're wrong. I'm not with you. That's an abstraction. That doesn't make sense. But if you, if you were to carry the critique far enough, at the end, you'd find an economic cause that you could specifically define. And what does Althusser say about that? You, yeah, in the end, it is economic, but we never reach the end because we're always within the process. So I wanted to know how you interpreted that part. Yeah, like I think in the last instance is like a, uh, it's like almost like a long durée thing, right? It's a, if you look at broad swaths of history, then economic forces are determinative. But when you look at the local and really get into the fine grain stuff, that's 
that's not going to help you. And it's just the last instance. Let's cast it out of our analysis for now and, and, and keep it in the background. That's kind of what I thought about it. But then, you know, this last instance never comes thing, right? Like later thinkers will hold that up as one of the contortions of, of Althusserian theory. Like, 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 look at this, look at this pretzel he's had to twist himself into. He's had to say, it's the last instance, but the last instance never comes. So that's that's a problem for some people. And and Laclau Mouffe want to just jettison the whole distinction, you know. And Althusser wants to break it up into four pieces. And others have different solutions to that problem. Okay. Um, but I I don't know. I I still today have the sense that that. Capital is what runs the show. No matter what, you know, there's there's local movements that can perhaps evade or 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 insulate themselves from markets and from global capitalism. But in the end, it's destined to fail, right? Like the fall of the Soviet Union, the entry of of China into the capitalist world markets, like these things, it just seems like, you know, it's capital right now just seems like the water that can just cut any mountain down given enough time. That's, that's what I kind of think. Of, I still think this last instance, it's never fully realized, but it's always kind of there. I don't know. You get the sense when you're looking at politics, when you're looking at decisions your school is making when you look at even your own life what am, what's what's going to motivate my behavior today it's it's often money <laughs> so i don't i don't see why this last instance thing is such a big deal but i do see the point of you know getting into these abstruse theoretical discussions or the, the at least the impulse to do it to see exactly like where to draw that line like where does this instance come into play What's the freedom between, you know, the structure, structural causation and, you know, free choice of, of an agent within this situation? I don't know. It's difficult to say, but I, th I think we do have a kind of local freedom, but mm, I don't know. Money makes the glass call in, in most situations that I'm privy to. Yeah, I think he, uh, I mean, I, I can see what he's doing there because the intention is to say, like, I'm not throwing this whole thing in the trash can. He's saying, I, I think, you know, money is the most important thing. But if you go into a theoretical situation where you're looking for an explanation and you start out with money in the first instance and say, like, if I follow the money, then I've explained it, then you're going to get a lot of things wrong. Like, if you come to, for example, the history of art and say every artist did everything they did for economic reasons in the end, you would be wrong. In the end, did the discourse of art just become wholly subservient to capital? Yes. Um, but the whole point, I think, of this of this last instance thing is you never you're never at the conclusion because history is still history. It's still a process of infinity events, infinity individual decisions. And if you start out by saying every single decision that's ever been made has been made with a financial incentive or to preserve the system of capital, then you just you're 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 gonna miss the trees because you're only looking for a forest. Yeah, it does make me appreciate the postmodern move to 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 level these these sort of conceptual hierarchies. Because if if economics is is determinative, then it's at the top of the conceptual hierarchy in Marxist thinking. And to me, that's kind of like trading a well, like a Cartesian like ontological dualism for a methodological dualism, where your method is divided down the middle between looking at infrastructure, and on the other hand, you're looking at culture or superstructure or whatever you want, whatever the fuck superstructure really is <laughs> and so you just you just trade one dualism for another and so i think collapsing these distinctions or de-hierarchizing them or or flattening that out it's not a flat ontology because it's not ontological it's methodological but even that's a problem right 
the difference between the system and the method, that's still a problem because the method is all important. So how do we see infrastructure and superstructure as sort of collapsed into one another? I think that would be maybe the postmodern move is to see them as as often switching places. Yeah. <laughs> one one person's infrastructure is another person's object of contemplation. There's no why would why would we point to one thing and say that is part of the infrastructure? Like you yeah. can't really do that because you're abstracting already from the messiness of life and and so you ju you're just fetishizing your method, methodological fetishism. Yeah, you can instead of you can see that with uh, Baudrillard, for example, like the signs, this exchange of signs is even more important than the exchange of commodities. Yeah. So hopefully if anybody has any recommendations on, on new things, <laughs> new, new thinking on these subjects, but I would look at sort of the newer Marxists too, like um, uh, Yale, I got to hand it to Yale University. They, they've they had their open Yale free lectures. And they post a lot of great stuff on on YouTube, just free lectures. I saw one between, uh, I forget the other guy's name, the guy I'm always harping on about, Michael, uh, Michael Heinrich, Mikhail Heinrich, who has a kind of Althusserian and new Marxist influence, Neue Marx, uh, who he's really against certain ways of looking at Marx and there are other is there I mean they they were arguing about chapter one of capital and how different their fucking readings were it was insane. Like is value determined in the productive process or does the market have to play a role? Like is is it is value determined by production and exchange is the question. And for some Marxists, it's production and exchange is sort of dependent on that value creation. Whereas for others, no value is created in the market. And with them, you know, the capitalist looks at that and then like can then look at their workshop and be like, okay, this is how I have to organize things. So and I'm a little more convinced by the sort of maybe the Heinrich not neo althusserian but like the, he's definitely like sympathetic towards this developmental reading of marx where there were revisions maybe not breaks but but evolution in marxist thinking up to the end of his life and even beyond cuz we're still like getting new texts and new drafts of the of capital and we're still waiting for the maga project to publish that enormous critical edition of all his works. <laughs> it sounded like you said MAGA project. Ma ma we're, MAGA. we're waiting on MAGA to finish their, their Marx, Marx translations. Make, make Althusser great again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, what he's ultimately saying here, and I think he, he actually goes in on angles for having a really bad interpretation of what it's economic in the last instance means, but he is pushing away as a good levi straussian might not a straussian levi straussian might in saying that there's so many objects of concern that if you reduce economic necessity to the only necessity in history which by the way again engels said was not true so any marxist who you hear say, saying that that's true disagrees even with engels who Althusser think is wrong for different reasons. But if you look at, if you say everything is only economic, then there is no point in doing anything in life at all except for economics. And that, I'm sorry, quite simply is not what human life is. And, and now a commercial for an investment app. <laughs> no, that's not what we want to be doing here. Yeah, he. I mean, economism, yeah, and technologism, those are the, the names for those kinds of thinking, right? Economism, market determines everything. Technologism, production determines everything. So I do think this view where value, which, you know, commodity form is constituted by value and value is an abstraction, right? It's abstract labor. It abstracts concrete labor, homogenizes it, sticks it in value, that becomes part of the commodity form, which is in exchange, values created in this way. And so there's there's a there's a relationship between production and the market in the creation of value. There's there's a role for both of those things. 
So it's kind of a techno economism. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's a better maybe that's a compromise to move forward with instead of choosing one or the other. Yeah, just not humanism. Yeah, just not humanism. We, we can do technology, we can do uh, economics, but no humanism. And what, like, yeah, I guess what I would say just to conclude this, despite what I say in other media and despite what I say because it's reduced to sound bites and 270 characters, there is no such thing as singular causation. That's a thing that I will hold to. That's what Altuzer is saying here. So it's useful heuristically. It's useful because sometimes you just have to tell a story. But if you look at the complexity of the world, of all the decisions that cannot ever be added up into an aggregate of decisions, there's always accidents, there's nothing necessary, then you got to be more careful. Which is, funnily enough, the same thing that many of the post-structuralist ling language people say about language. There is no singular references that you can just close and leave on the table and walk away from. Yeah, and over-determination is a nice way of, of saying that complex causation. You know, we might talk about, in systems theory, we might talk more about circular causation, the way that, but even in that case, you gotta be kind of careful, but yeah. Complexity, right? Causal complexity is always what is going on. There's no simple abstract principles that are simply opposed and then absorbed and suppressed. <laughs> Which is exactly, we studied this for two months. This is exactly what Guy Debord just had no understanding of. The spectacle, that's all fake. Production and ownership, that's all real. All we're dealing with is fake shit. They don't interact at all. That's wrong, sorry. Yeah, yeah, because that's, you know, yeah, Baudrillard is, is probably a little more nuanced and uh, and deep than, than and, and then he would never say that there's like sort of an economic behind the, <laughs> the spectacle, which is what it's all really about. The spectacle is just the veneer on, on capital circulation. Or Deleuze, right? There's not, there's not these layers. There's not like the one layer that leads into the next one or the one layer that is primary and then secondary layers on top of that. You need imminent theory, not layered of the the important things that we've decided are important compared to the accidents that we've decided are not important. Yeah, yeah. He flirted early on with the surface depth stuff. And then by the time he's writing with Gautari, they're talking about double articulation, which is quite different. A whole other can of worms. But yeah, I, I, I like this move towards... I don't know, I guess you'd say away from maybe Hegelian objective idealism, which is which is like monistic, right? It's mo it's not a dualism. It's it's it seems to me to be monistic. Um but it's idealist in its objectivity, and we need to be more of a materialist objectivist and 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 even like pay attention to when like methodological dualism begins to creep into our thinking and we start to make these separations and forget that they're just formal yeah that they're just to help us understand yeah it's a it's a monism with very knowable moments as opposed to this which is an anti-dualism that's just saying there's no in the in the end case there's no one who knows anything which is not to say that all knowledge is equivalent. It's just to say that whenever you know one thing, you are simplifying it at the expense of another thing. And that's just the way that knowledge works. Yeah. So his, his, I think all of it adds up to, um, I, I like this term from Kerry Wolf, even though he's criticizing it, uh, he calls it a syncretic totality. So you gotta, you gotta look at the totality and see it as a confluence of, of of different fragments from different historical periods, and not as a homogenous whole, but as a heterogeneous totality, which includes sort of past and future in it. Old modes, new modes, emergent modes, fading out of existence modes kind of things happening all at the same time. And keep an eye on the United States for that uh, intense... <laughs> collection of, of over-determination. Yeah, that's the thing. That there is a totality, but it's not a determined totality. It's a 
totality that is not just too complex because there's too much information. It is just fundamentally too complex to ever become the object of knowledge, which is why you can't predict. But you're right. Yeah, it's contested and conflicted all the way down. There's no it's it's like a battlefield, right? You look at it you look at a text like a war zone and even even if it was written by one person, you go into it and you try to see like where are these ideas coming from? How is this like a battlefield that could be contradicting itself? And those contradictions will be revealing if you're doing a symptomatic reading of things. Uh-oh, we're getting into Derrida. Before we get into Derrida, <laughs> let's not um, let's specters of Mars so, almost an hour and a half. So we will close it and ship it. Eric, thank you very much for being with me. I think that was uh, productive. Let's call it productive. Yeah, my pleasure. Bag them and tag them. All right. Thank you, listeners. Uh, always like your feedback, but we are going to close it there. Thank you, listeners. Special thanks to patrons. Of course. Over and out. Peace.